It's been ten months since my homemade helicopter broke its drive shaft, and I haven't touched it since. It's been sitting in my workshop, gathering dust. We all know what happened and can still read the comments, some highly encouraging, some highly discouraging. This project has always been a controversial one, not in my mind, but definitely in the wider audience. The way I see it is it was no more dangerous than some other extreme sports, comparable to skydiving, paragliding, rock climbing or scuba diving. I never relied on special equipment to breathe, I never went over one miles an hour, and I never went above three feet high, and yet if you watch videos on extreme sports and read the comments, the reaction is virtually all positive. Not so with home-built aviation. Look at comments on the Amazing DIY Projects channel, Cameron Carter, and most recently, Alan Zhang. Alan has had a ton of negative comments, and yet he hasn't even confirmed that he will attempt to fly his human-carrying drone. Why there is this reaction to home-built aviation, and apparently not to other activities that in my view are similar in risk, I find interesting. I guess it's hard to assess the actual risks involved for each activity. We may also assume that just because a flying machine has been built, that the user is going to try and use that machine to its full potential. Some people build these things with no intention of flying them, but the assumption from onlookers remains the same. After 10 months of thinking about the helicopter I made, there is one thing I don't like about it, and that is the fact that it's broken. Use it or not, why not just fix it? Coming up with a bespoke dry shaft would be a fun engineering challenge, which I'll enjoy. There were many helpful suggestions in the comments saying to use a universal joint both ends and a spline slip joint in the middle. This is what I'm going to do, but unfortunately I can't use a spline slip joint because it won't plunge easily under torque. I couldn't find any dry shaft slip joints online that had bearings to relieve the friction under torque, so this is what I've come up with. Two pieces of aluminium box section separated by flat cage needle roller bearings. The maximum constant torque this engine produces is 55 pounds feet. If I apply this torque to the sections, I can still move the joint in and out. This certainly looks promising, but I've not seen this type of dry shaft used anywhere before. I didn't even know flat cage needle roller bearings existed until I stumbled across them by chance. The more I can fit in there, the stronger the joint will be. I now need to remind myself how much travel is required. 50 millimeters is the minimum, but on the disaster video, I mentioned that I actually hit the full forward cyclic limit. Measuring the mass tilt, I have six degrees in pitch and six degrees in roll. Pitch needs to be increased by at least two degrees. To achieve that is simple. Either I use shim to raise the clearance required or I remove material from the hinge plate. I'll need to make a new clutch drum in order to locate my new universal joints and also a new drive spindle to the primary drive pulley. Before going further, let's get the machine out and see if it will start. The engine might have been over revved, so that is a concern. <laughs>
In a previous video, I talked about the drawbacks to a fixed pitch rotor system. I said that it isn't a good idea for various reasons. I've had to think about this, and although I still think what I said is correct, I also think that if the machine was only to be used in very calm conditions, keep the altitude low and the speed, it could be used safely. So I believe then that this still has a place as a learning tool. Plus, it's seriously fun. The flexible drive coupling, which had a large part to play in the drive shaft failure, I'm not going to incorporate this time. The reason I wanted it was to take out the torque spikes that engine produces. I was worried it could snap a drive belt or other drive component. In the end, ironically, it helped cause the failure. If we look at the hinge mast assembly, it's easy to see there is flex in the frame and some flex in the hinges. I think this flex could be considered a flex coupling. I really don't see how any significant torque spikes could be transmitted to the drive components when this flex is present. It's possible to see these torque spikes during the running up of the rotors. Notice the drive frame wobbling back and forth. This is most pronounced during the acceleration period. When it's at full speed, the power delivery appears smooth. I think if there was a point where something could break, it is likely to be during this period of acceleration and rough running rather than at full power. I need to decide if I'm going to attempt to add a sprag or overrun clutch. This is standard equipment on normal helicopters, but I didn't have one installed for the later stages of this project. The benefit of an overrun is torque spikes can only be applied in one direction. And also, if the engine was to seize, it wouldn't put huge amounts of deceleration stress on the drive system. The centrifugal clutch would automatically disengage at an engine RPM of 2500, allowing the remainder of the rotor inertia to spool down slowly. The benefit of not having an overrun is that with fixed pitch rotors, a reduction in lift is more rapid. A benefit at times and a disadvantage at other times. I'll have to think about that. I'm sure it's possible to reintroduce an overrun, but I would probably have to make my own on this occasion. Previously, I did have sprag bearings driving the primary drive pulley. It worked great, but I had to remove them when I changed the reduction ratio. Lots to think about, and this drive shaft fix is not exactly a small job. The flying boat is priority, but I'm looking forward to fixing the helicopter in the not too distant future. I think the helicopter is going to be one of those projects that just takes years to perfect. All helicopters are extremely demanding on the rotating components and of course you can't just over engineer everything or it will be too heavy to fly. The engine is having to produce very near full power constantly. Not many other vehicles where this is the case. What manufacturers try and do is derate the engine, make it run at a lower power or RPM. My Johnson engine is running at 5500 RPM. It will actually rev to 6500 and produce more power but better to keep it on the low side I think. More updates as things progress.